This is an opportunity to show the world um, why Victoria is an international leader in medical research and biotechnology. We know we've already always had a very, very strong base, but we want to commercialise that base, look at partnerships and look at, look at getting the best and most talented people we can as part of those partnerships. And that's precisely why we're here today. And I'm very delighted to, to uh, announce today that Melbourne will become home to two new world-leading projects that will significantly boost our innovation capacities. Firstly, a new $57 million centre for nanofabrication near the Australian Synchrotron, which is uh, ready and will, will start work in July this year. And importantly, this centre for nanofabrication will be adjacent to that in Clayton as well. It's a great fit. And also at 9.5 million, Metabolomics uh, Australian Centre based at the University of Melbourne. Again, our other biotechnology node in Melbourne at the Parkville Precinct. Our government itself will invest $15 million in the Melbourne Centre for nanofabrication. And this will be Australia's flagship facility for groundbreaking advances in nanotechnology. It will train up to 25 engineers and scientists in advanced design and product development. It will also provide a gateway, uh, gateway for industry access research and development from five Victorian universities and the CSIRO nationally. So today, building on the Premier's announcements, the significant announcements we've made really locking in Melbourne's leadership in nanotechnology, I have two other announcements to make. Uh, the first is a new technology that could really revolutionise the treatment of diabetes. And we all know about diabetes. We know that uh, it has a devastating and growing impact around the world. Nearly one million Australians uh, out of 20 million people presently live with that disease. And if you look at the growth projections going forward, something like one in four young Australian males is either type 2 diabetic or has early type 2 diabetes symptoms. So a uh, Victorian-based company, uh, Interstitial Nanosystems, has developed groundbreaking technology based on the work of nanotechnology Victorian partners to enable people uh, with diabetes to receive insulin but without the needle. Uh, their innovative transdermal delivery patch, so it's a patch that goes on the body, will potentially lead to the pain-free delivery uh, of insulin and then, of course, of other medicines if this technique works well. And it's going to work well particularly, we think, with young children and people who are needle phobic. The transdermal patch has been tested by the Victorian College of Pharmacy and we're expecting preclinical trials to start as early as September. The second announcement concerns uh, meningococcal disease. And meningococcal disease is included in the World Health Organisation, uh, their top 10 morbidity list. It affects something like 700 Australians each year. Meningococcal disease is very difficult to diagnose in the early stages, uh, and the telltale signs are not always evident. In Victoria, hundreds of thousands of children have been receiving a free meningococcal C vaccine since 2003 as what is part of a national campaign. But any new product that makes it easier to detect what is a, a frightening disease, a terrible disease, particularly in teenagers and adults who are unlikely to have been vaccinated, is obviously very welcome. So I'm pleased to announce today that another new Victorian commercial venture, which has been spun off by Nanovic, which is Quintane Nanosystems, is developing a new rapid clinical test that can accurately detect meningococcal disease. The breakthrough really paves the way for Quintane NS to develop and commercialise di diagnostic technologies and reagents for the detection of a range of other diseases as well. Just one other brief thing if I can. Uh, Professor Hermann Spandenberg is here today. Uh, Herman, of course, from the Department of Primary Industries and in partnership with La Trobe University, has also developed a technology called LXR that could potentially double crop yields with improved environmental and health outcomes. And we also have here today Professor Paul Fisher, the Chair in Microbiology at La Trobe, who's discovered what he believes is the underlying cause of uh, mitochondrial diseases, so uh, really nerve diseases. Uh, which affect thousands of people in the United States and worldwide every year. Really this is um, funding from the state, funding from research institutions combining together uh, to really have centres of excellence around uh, Bio21, around Parkville and around Clayton. So we believe this is the next step in the nodes of research that we've undertaken in Victoria.
Um, Manovic is supported and funded by the Victorian Government. I think it's fair to say without that support, without uh, Nano Victoria, uh, you wouldn't have seen these commercial opportunities developed. And as a result, I think what you'll see now in the case of both the diabetes application uh, and the testing for meningococcal, uh, these are diseases very widespread throughout the world. Uh, these are very practical applications of nanotechnology developed in Victoria and developed with the support of the BRAX government for NanoVic. Well, obviously um, enormous significance uh, in relation to um, less intrusive uh, treatment of uh, uh, of insulin, uh, that, that's got enormous benefits for a whole range of people right around the world. Uh, less intrusive, easier application, much more convenient in lifestyle, and this is very, very important. And uh, for some people, of course, they who have resistance to intravenous um, injections, I think it's going to be a great benefit. And as well, to have a better diagnosis of meningococcal, it's one of those dreadful diseases that devastate families. Um, for, for, uh, actually diagnosing it earlier, getting on top of it earlier, looking at prevention by the diagnosis, that is going to be an important thing which will save many families distress from what is a disease which is very, very hard to pick, very hard to diagnose and has been one of the great mysteries really in diseases around the world. Essentially this is, this is work which has been carried out in Victoria uh, at La Trobe University and it's uh, looking at uh, crop yields and identifying the, the genes which develop and determine the crop yields and this research undertaken by Hermann Spandenberg um, looks like it may well double uh, crop yields. With the in vitro diagnostics, I mean the benefits are very similar to those for the in vivo diagnostics as well because in fact you get the benefit of using the, nano, the nanoparticles and the fact that you can have very good strong reagents which act immediately so it's, it's kind of real time immediate responses that you see rather than having to send things off to a lab um, for, a, for a long term test response. The other thing is these are actually platform technologies and although we talk about cardiovascular as a product and we talk about meningococcal as a, a, a product for uh, the in vitro, in fact they can be used for a whole range of diagnostics and, and that's the real value is the, the applicability of them to a whole range of, of different disease areas that, that we can target. And so cardiovascular and meningococcal are, are just examples if you like for us but in fact they can be used for, for prostate um, cancer um, diagnosis and a whole range of other um, infectious disease diagnoses as well. But it's around on the fact that it's simple to use in talking about the in vitro diagnostics. Mm -hmm. um, it's not going to be expensive, um, it doesn't need special training and it can be used in a whole range of um, situations. So it could be used in the bush, um, it could be used in remote communities, it can be used in the doctor's hospitals. Talk to uh, people in hospitals that were dealing with a meningeal cockle and, and diagnosing meningeal cockle and the message that was coming back from them was the fact they wanted something which was an, an immediate test for meningeal cockle disease um, so that they could actually start applying antibiotics much quicker because as you know it's a disease which progresses really fast. So. The current thinking on mitochondrial diseases which uh, are genetic disorders that affect the energy powerhouses in the cell was that the cell runs out of energy and that causes the problems. What we have found is that the cells actually have an energy sensing smoke alarm, a protein that is activated when there is a problem with the powerhouses and it is the activation of that protein that smoke alarm that actually shuts off the cellular activities and causes the disease symptoms. In the organism that we've tested this in, which is the slime mold, um, if we turn down the smoke alarm, the symptoms go away completely. So the problem never was that the cell didn't have enough energy, it was just the smoke alarm was activated. A bit like when you're cooking toast, uh, it causes a problem if the smoke alarm goes off. You turn the smoke alarm off, everything's fine. The mitochondrial diseases themselves are relatively rare, so we're talking about uh, an incidence of about one in 4,000. But mitochondrial dysfunction, so non-functioning mitochondria, have also been implicated in all of the major neurodegenerative disorders. So that includes Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, uh, Huntington's disease, uh, Lou Gehrig's syndrome, Rett's syndrome, and a variety of others. So you see your research having potential implications in um diseases really that impact millions of people that, worldwide. That's right. If, if it turns out that uh, mitochondrial dysfunction is the main cause for what goes wrong in the cells in these diseases, then our work suggests ways in which you might be able to treat them and, and ameliorate the symptoms.